I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, Srizan Sen, who's the Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg Professor of uh, Depression and Neurosciences, Director of the Eisenberg Family Depression Center at the University of Michigan. And uh, I've known Srizan for a long time and he's been a, a terrific uh, member of our uh, Prisker uh, uh, Family Foundation Supported Consortium that includes uh, University of Michigan and Stanford, amongst others. And he uh, really has pioneered in a very interesting in vivo, in life uh, uh, model uh, to study stress and depression, namely looking at house staff uh, who uh, are under enormous stress, uh, particularly in the internship year and has collected data on now thousands of individuals and is a member of the National Academy of Medicine Collaborative on Clinician Well-Being, and, and uh, we are delighted to have him. And uh, this also will dovetail with an interview that we'll do with uh, Justin Bullock, who's written on his own experiences as uh, a house staff member and uh, with uh, um, experiencing suicidal uh, ideation and behavior. Anyway, uh, Srijan, take it away. Thanks, Alan. Thanks so much for inviting me and, and having me in, with this group. Um, as Alan mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about our study looking at the specific population and, and suicide risk and depression in, in training physicians. Um, I'm really excited about um, uh, Dr. Bullock's uh, interview uh, on this topic um, later on. So the interest and in, in, um, conversation around uh, uh, well-being among physicians has really grown dramatically in the last few years. And in particular, I've been really gratified and, and impressed by the, the courage of so many people who um, have talked about their own experiences and, and uh, with, with, um, with suicide attempts, with depression, anxiety, um, during their time as training physicians and physicians, this one on the screen is one that um, is particularly close to my heart. Amol was a uh, is a family friend um, who uh, I grew up with, and and um, after a, a really difficult call during his residency, he um, jumped off his uh, the balcony in his apartment and was paralyzed from the waist down um, about twenty years ago. Um, but has been on a remarkable journey since then, and and in a in a piece in JAMA Neurology earlier this year talked about his experiences and what he's learned and 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 the, the factors that he feels are important in 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 suicide prevention and mental health particularly among doctors um and I'd encourage you to read this one but there are dozens of others that have come out in our our leading journals almost every week um and it's really um gratifying to see sort of the goal of our study um is to try to provide sort of a, a empirical or quantitative um uh, uh, complement to, to a lot of the stories and anecdotes that, that, um, people talk about, uh, we've been doing the study for 16 years now, um, following, um, folks as they enter internship, we, we, each year, uh, the match happens, um, in March and we invite, um, a few thousand of these interns across the country to take part in the study. We assess them, you know, during, um, April, May, and June when, when, they're relatively stress-free and don't quite know what they're in for, and then follow them as they go through their intern year. We followed about 25,000 interns over the past 16 years um, across the U.S. and, and in, in China and Kenya and a couple other countries um, across, uh, across specialties. Sort of the crux of the study and, and um, a lot of the outcomes will be the, the what happens with the start of internship um, before the year starts about Three four percent of these incoming interns are depressed at any given time of the year. About a quarter of them are depressed. So a, a dramatic increase in depression. Um, similarly, before the year starts, about two percent express any suicidal ideation. During the year, about ten or eleven percent um, express suicidal ideation at any given time. Um, similar increases in in anxiety and PTSD symptoms. So across the board of of uh, mental health symptoms, and it's not just sort of you know, responses to uh, to questionnaires, we can actually see physiological effects of the of the stress that that interns are going through, and 
and likely stress more broadly. Um, this is a study of uh, telomeres. Telomeres are, are sort of the caps on the ends of our chromosomes. And um, Elizabeth Blackburn's won, won a Nobel Prize showing that they're, they're um, one of the cellular markers of aging, that they get shorter at a predictable rate, um, about 25 base pairs a year um, as we get older. Um, in interns, the during intern year, um, telomeres get shorter at about 125 base pairs a year. So, um, uh, accelerated aging uh, at about five to six fold. And you can see here that that work hours seems to be the strongest correlation with people working 75 or more hours had about 30 fold increased in in telomere attrition. So, um, uh, so this is sort of just another way, another marker of of the impact of internship. Um, over the years, we've looked at a lot of different factors that um, uh, both before the year, individual factors during the year, and, and sy systemic factors that um, all correlate with an increased risk of um, suicidality and a similar um, but not quite identical list of factors that um, associate with an increased risk of depression during the year. Um, each of these has um, what I'd like to think is an interesting story behind it. Um, uh, I'll just go through one of them. Um, uh, the strongest correlation and the strongest factor that we found for both um, suicidality and depression is is work hours, um, how long the the interns are working. Um, and this has been sort of a topic of interest and in, in discussion for uh, for many years going back to you know the Libby Zion case in in the 80s. Um, the ACGME is the accrediting group that that, um, sets guidelines and and they've they've tweaked with duty hours a few times. Um, in 2011, they put in new restrictions and reforms around duty hours. Um, uh, in, interestingly, they didn't really have much effect on um, on well being measured a few different ways, um, but notably they they didn't um, uh, they didn't. Uh, target duty hours per se, and, or mean duty hours, but but put a cap on the maximum uh, level of uh, hours shifts um, interns could work, reducing that from about 30 hours to 16 hours. But we and others found that it didn't change the mean effect, mean amount of work hours that that interns or, or residents were working. Um, we had a study uh, last week in New England Journal um, using the intern uh, health study data to emulate a clinical trial um, that was um, targeting actual work hours. Um, and you can see here, there's a pretty strong and linear effect between work hours and depression. Um, so interns working 80, 85, 90 hours a week have about three times greater increase in depressive symptoms um, and a parallel increase in, in suicidal ideation compared to uh, interns working, let's say 40 hours a week. Um, uh, so a strong effect and strong, a much stronger effect than any other factor we look at and and uh, an effect that continues to go down, the depression continues to go down all the way down to lower work hour levels in the 20, 30, 40 um, hour range. So um, this suggests that work hours is a really important target. Um, and if you had to pick one, probably the most important target for reducing uh, depression among training physicians and, and likely physicians in general. Um, and, and we do in fact have some evidence that. Hey everyone, unfortunately, since we lost Dr. Sun, oh, there he is, he's back. Um, so as you're saying here that, that we've seen an increase an improvement in, in depression among the training physicians, um, of about 25%. And it's been driven by a few factors, but most, um, most strongly work hours that, that a decrease in work hours of about seven hours a week has, uh, has been the primary driver of the improved, uh, depression here. Um, I talk mostly about um, depression and, and suicidal ideation, and we focus mostly on that in our, our study. That's It's a little bit of a contrast to the broader conversation on uh, physician well-being, which has really focused a lot on uh, burnout. Uh, there's been um, a National Academy report recently on burnout. The Surgeon General put out a report on burnout. Um, and there's been a, a lot of progress in sort of stigma reduction around burnout. I think it's much more acceptable for a, a typical physician to identify as burned out than it was a few years ago. Um, I think mostly inadvertently, but a lot of the conversation around burnout has um, 
has contrasted burnout to depression um, and as part of the process of normalizing burnout. And I'm hoping that we can expand that conversation to include depression and, and suicide. Um, these are just a couple of quotes from that are um, from the literature, but there, there are dozens of others like it. Um, and they each sort of try to frame um, burnout as a systems issue, but contrast it to depression as an individual issue. Um, I think, at least in physicians, it, it that's not um, that simple framing is not is not correct. Um, there's been a lot written about the the relationship between burnout and depression, um, and part of the confusion I think stems from burnout being a very broad term. We tried to do a meta analysis of rates of burnout among physicians, but it was impossible to complete because a, across 180 studies of burnout, there are 140 definitions. When it when burnout's to fit, defined in sort of a gold standard way by the Maslach burnout industry, um, inventory, it looks a lot like depression. Um, the same seven or eight factors um, out of 35 that predict depression also predict burnout, and burnout and depression have the same um, balance between individual factors like personality and, and previous mental health history and, and workplace factors. Um, so at least in physicians, depression and burnout look the same. I think one of the things that are lost when we focus only on burnout and, and encourage uh, um, physicians to identify as, as burnt out rather than depressed is all the evidence-based, um, particularly individual level interventions that we know and we've heard a lot about today that are effective at um, uh, preventing and treating um, depression and, and suicide risk. In contrast, there really aren't any individual um, level interventions for, for burnout. Uh, my hope is if we can expand the conversation to include depression, anxiety, and suicide risk, um, we can open up access to those sorts of interventions and also make it much easier to identify targets for a forum like work hours that we can do with a really well-validated measures of depression that we have, and we don't quite have those measures in, in burnout. Um, so the, the last few minutes, I'll talk um, a little bit about how um, hopefully the study is not only informing mental health among um, physicians and training physicians, but um, because internship is, is a relatively unusual place where we can um, uh, predict that a, that a group of relatively healthy individuals will encounter a major stress and, and have an increase in depression, we can um, identify um, prevention um, targets that that could help improve um, uh, uh, improve well-being and depression um, in in the broader population. So we know, and I think we've learned even more during the pandemic of of all the sort of individual factors and and um, about our workplaces, our schools, and and personal lifestyle that are that are important for well-being and, and depression, um, from how we're sleeping and exercising, connecting with others, um, eating, so many other things. Uh, one of the things we hear often hear from patients is is there's so many things that are important and it's impossible to do do them all every day to stay as well as possible and and in reality we all vary in how important each of these factors is for us. Um, so one of the directions we've gone with the study is trying to understand sensitive sensitivity to these each of these different risk factors um, and potential prevention targets. Um, uh, for depression and, and suicide risk. And, and a bunch of them come up in internships, so we focused on those. Um, uh, part of uh, the variation in our, our sensitivity to these is, is, is genetic and, and genomics has, has you know, the technology has advanced pretty rapidly in the last um, 10, 15 years. Um, uh, there's these, these um, instead of looking at individual loci now, we can look across all 20 million um, loci in the genome and calculate different scores, polygenic risk scores for different traits and, and diseases. And we've been incorporating those into our study. Um, this is one example. This is a polygenic risk score for depression. And, and the folks in the dark blue line are the people with high polygenic risk scores for depression. And the light blue line are low polygenic risk score for depression. Um, and across the, the bottom, across the x-axis, um, you can see social support. So in general, social support decreases during internship. And on the left side of the graph, you can see in conditions where people lose a lot of social support, 
um, the people with high polygenic risk for depression have much more depression than people with low polygenic risk. Um, but as you move across to people who have um, uh, don't lose social support and, and in some cases gain social support, you see the the um, scenario flip that people with this high polygenic risk for depression are actually doing better, are less depressed than people with a low polygenic risk. So this polygenic marker um, doesn't seem to be really a, a marker for depression, but more sensitivity to, in this case, the, the social environment and social support. Um, as part of the study, we also have all the, the thousands of interns each year wear Fitbits and, and fill out questions on an, on an app um, so we can get some more objective information um, related to you know, sleep and activity. This is sleep right here. Um, you can see uh, both the total sleep duration that interns have each night, but even more than that, the, the um, consistency of their sleep, if they're sleeping the same amount every night and at the same time, those are both really strong predictors of depression. Um, and a similar pattern holds with exercise and physical activity. And, and like we saw for social support, we see different um, polygenic markers that seem to underlie susceptibility to, to those factors. So, so um, chronotype is whether you're an evening person or morning uh, person, and, and morning people seem to be particularly susceptible to, to low sleep duration. Um, whereas evening people are more susceptible to having an inconsistent amount of sleep time. And, and we see a different polygenic risk factor um, being important in how susceptible you are to, to physical inactivity. So this is early days, but hopefully um, this kind of work can help identify and get us to a more personalized profile to figure out what factors are most important for our individual risk for um, depression, um, suicidality, and, and other mental health problems. Um, so I jumped through a lot of findings, but hopefully it gave you a flavor of, of different things going on. I think the most important point is that in this population of, of trained physicians, the, the rates of uh, depression are, are way too high. Um, we're starting to see some progress and, and work hours has been the major driver of that progress, but the evidence um, shows that even greater reductions in work hours and some other factors um, can help drive the depression and, and suicide risk even lower. And hopefully this can also help inform ways of preventing depression from a sort of public health perspective in the broader population uh, much more effectively than, than we um, can currently do now. So um, thanks for listening. I'll stop sharing and would love to hear any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, are the findings related to stress and aging seen across all fields of internship? Um, yes, uh, uh, at least um, as far as we can tell, but certainly across surgeons and internists and psychiatrists, um, uh, it, it seems to hold. It's a little bit the uh, the number of hours uh, that re uh, uh, surgeons seem to be able to uh, tolerate slightly higher hours um, than non-surgeons or and at, with the same telomere attrition, but the pattern is is about the same. But great question. Do you know if this is also these? I mean, these issues are also being addressed in schools, or are they typically being addressed in in hospital settings, or in both? Um, I'm not. Uh, I think they're they're being um, talked about in 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 all set in in different settings. I'm not sure if they're referring to medical school or or schools in in terms of colleges and high schools. Um, I think we don't have quite as good data in. In, in in any of those other settings, though, though we're, we're um, hopefully as a field getting there. Um, I would imagine that, that the um, uh, the drivers might be different in different settings. Certainly in in, um, in high school and college, we're seeing a, a few different factors, but I think the similar approach of, of really getting large cohorts and following them can help identify the, the the driving factors in each setting and, and identifying what to target. Thank you. Um, is there a correlation with work hours and suicidality in other fields, such as social work or other mental health providers? Um, we don't know. I, I, um, they really, again, we, we, we need better data in, in other, other populations and particularly other populations of um, clinicians. We're, starting to get data on on nurses and seeing pretty similar relationships. I have not seen data on social workers 
um, and it would be uh, I've, I've seen some work that that workload sort of subjective perceptions of workload is related to similar burnout and depression in social workers, but it'd be great to see it with objective data and, and work hours. So I would suspect it's probably true, but um, again, it'd be great to get better data. Do you know if any research has been done around the ability or difficulty for um, interns to receive mental health assistance of any kind? Yeah, great question. I think um, uh, it's uh, the stigma around getting help is, um, at least historically, has been really high among uh, among interns and and doctors in general, um, and and higher among doctors than the general population, which is um, concerning because you know we're supposed to be educated and and um, uh, less susceptible to that. Um, a lot of it has been barriers towards not having time to get help, what colleagues will think, um, and 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 some concerns about licensing and, and state licensing board asking questions about getting treatment, um, um, which have in, inhibited people from getting help. Um, I think uh, our data that I briefly showed is that that's improving among these younger training physicians that um, uh, about um, 12 years ago, on, only about 9% of interns who were depressed got help. And now that's up to um, uh, 33%. Um, particularly it's gone up a lot in women, um, training physicians for them. It's, it's above 50%. It hasn't gone up nearly as much as men. And w again, we don't have a great data, but the, the sense that is it, it hasn't gone up nearly as much in, in physicians in practice and older physicians. So, um, so I think we're ma making progress with the, um, uh, with uh, younger physicians, um, uh, and we need to expand that up to older physicians. I think part of it, and there's been progress in getting state licensing boards to get rid of questions that are stigmatizing or or that have the potential for penalizing um, physicians for getting help. I think the more and more um, we, you know, pieces like I, I referenced at the beginning of the talk, um, people talk about their own depression, their own um, you know, suicide attempts and, and, um, particularly leaders, the, the more it becomes normalized to, to talk about it and to get help. And, and I think that that should, um, make progress as, as well. So we have more work to do, but I think there's, there's signs of progress there. When preliminaries have been shortened due to stress, do they regenerate? Is there a way to res reverse this aging process? Yeah, a, re a really good question, and I think one area not not certainly not just for physicians, but everyone that that um, um, needs more ex exploration. Um, I think the only strong data I've seen has been through like intense meditation, like camp, and not just like you know headspace for ten minutes a day, but um, but uh, retreats that last for a week long that that seem to have had some. Um, uh, effect of, of in, in increasing telomere length. I would think more um, broadly, most of the things that we know are um, effective in, in, uh, in, in wellness. So, so getting sufficient sleep um, and, and, and sleep at the right time of day, exercise, social connection. We, we know at the very least reduce the, the rate that um, of telomere attrition and maybe have the potential to reverse the effect. But I think focusing on, on those sorts of things um, um, are, are probably safe bets to, um, uh, uh, to help at that cellular level in addition to the, the more clinical level that we know it helps at. Thank you. Would you explain a little more about chronotype risks? Sure. So, um, uh, so chronotype, like I mentioned, is, is sort of our... Um, our tendency to be either a, a early bird or a evening lark, and like many other things, it has a strong genetic like thing. Like fifty, sixty percent of it is is heritable, and and from large data sets like the UK Biobank, we can have a polygenic risk score for that. And and it seems like chronotype does, from you know studies of ours and others, have a really profound effect of of 
of many things, you know, other, others have found that, that your chronotype affects how effective the medications you're taking are. And, and, um, and depending on your chronotype, taking med meds at different times of day may be more or less effective. Um, uh, we find that it, it really affects um, in a few different ways, but how you, in this case, respond to shift change that, um, uh, that um, night people really do better when, when they're able to shift um, forward, essentially staying up later, whereas morning people respond better to, to shift backwards where they can um, get up earlier. Um, we even find in response to daily on that changes in, um, in March or next week that it takes the chronic people with a night chronotype about a week longer to adjust to it than morning people um, because of how they're set up. And, and so um, outside of the specific context of internship, knowing your chronotype and, and um, can help to, um, help you to, to adjust how to, how to, you know, set up your life in which ways it might be easier to, to change or deal with jet lag and, and, and things like that. So I think we're realizing it's a, it's an increasingly important factor and the wearables that I touched on a little bit can help us identify both our chron chronotype and how we're, how we're adjusting to, to challenges in our, um, challenges to our circadian systems in, in, in different ways. Thank you. Would you speak briefly about the stigma related to seeking help amongst the medical community? Yeah, um, I, th I think it's it's historically been a, a real a real problem and um, and and stigmatized it, it. You know that that as physicians we shouldn't we should be tough we shouldn't and and that seeking help is is a sign of weakness, um, and 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 that that's really harmful. I think. Particularly in the context of of suicide, I think um, there's been a pattern of physicians for depression, substance use, many things not seeking help because of of the stigma and, and fear of um, of um, some some sort of retribution until things are at a crisis stage and and a higher risk for suicide. As I talked about, I think that's um, changing and and particularly among our younger generation, but we need to keep pushing um, that and, and normalizing seeking help so um, people can can get help earlier. One last question and I'll let you go. Um, have you found that hospitals and medical settings are receptive to this information? Do you know we know if they're making any changes due to this misinformation? I, I think a little bit. I mean, I think we, like I showed a little bit that, that work hours are, are are down over the last decade, which is which is good. Um, I think there's um, so I think there are changes to be made. I think it's some of the changes like increasing staffing and and reducing work hours are expensive, and so um, I think naturally workplaces are more willing to make changes that are that are free or or cheap. Um, so I, I think it, it's an effort to push them towards doing the things that are expensive, but I think there's enough evidence now that, um, you know, the, 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 um, attrition from the workforce and reduced productivity that comes with, um, more depression, poor well-being have costs on their own and probably greater costs than what it takes to invest. So, um, so I think we're seeing variation across workplaces, but, um, but, but, but that they are responding. Good to hear. Dr. Sen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, really appreciate it.